the simplest way to make more microbial protein is to feed more room integrated carbohydrate, especially starch. Unfortunately, with starch, the more you add, it's um, it you can increase microbial protein, but in a decreasing way. So the efficiency of protein synthesis will go down. And that's really what I've been trying to study is how do you help prevent that decline in, def in efficiency. Hi, my name is Bill Weiss. I'm the host of the uh, Dairy Nutrition Black Belt. I guess today's a, a longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Perkins from Ohio State University. He's been a professor there. He just became a distinguished professor there, but he's worked for 35 years in the area of rumen microbiology, microbial protein synthesis, and how all this relates to, to dairy nutrition. Jeff, welcome to the Black Belt. Thank you, Bill. Um, what we're going to talk about today is not any specific paper, but like I said, you've spent your career working on microbial protein synthesis. And I guess, wh why is it so important to dedicate a whole whole career to? Good question. I think I was asked something like that in my interview. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, it's the main source of a protein for the cow. It helps to equalize the, the amino acids uh, that are in the diet. And um, as you know, but maybe not everybody does, microbial protein is a really good source of lysine, methionine, all the essentials basically except for histidine. So uh, it really, it really is key in that way. In a typical dairy diet, I know there's really no typical dairy diet. What what proportion of met metabolizable protein generally comes from microbial, and what would be rumen undegradable? Yeah, so it typically would be between 60, 70 percent. So, uh, in depending on on the kind of diets that you have, the the forages and so on, but. Yeah, so the majority is going to be microbial protein, nearly two thirds. And you said it depends on diet. So what are some diet things that we can do to enhance microbial protein synthesis? Well, this, the simplest way to make more microbial protein is to feed more room integrated carbohydrate, especially starch. Unfortunately, with starch, the more you add, it's um, it you can increase microbial protein, but in a decreasing way. So the efficiency of protein synthesis will go down. And that's really what I've been trying to study is how do you help prevent that decline in, def in efficiency? One way is to make sure you have adequate room, room integrated protein, RDP. And so lots and lots of studies show deficiency of RDP will limit microbial protein compared with where it could have been or where it's predicted to be in, in the software that someone's using to feed cows. A typical dairy diet is, at least according to the models, is excess in RDP. Most, you know, so it, it, in these typical diets, do you think RDP still comes into play or is it we feed so much that that's a, a non-issue? Uh, so, yeah, of course, RDP kind of depends on which system they're using um, the same feed will be a little bit different RDP depending on which software. But generally speaking, uh, it, it can be in excess. And but of course, people are trying to decrease that excess to to decrease nitrogen excretion into the environment. And with the push to do that, that's really kind of reinvigorated some of some of our research to try to figure out, well, how much RDP do you actually need? And um, as you probably know, if you look look across metadata, it's, it kind of says more RDP is better and yeah. just kind of keeps on going. We know that isn't really right, but that's that's kind of what, what we see. You know, we have multiple sources of RDP from urea or NPN to almost like soy has a lot of protein, actual protein. Says, does the form of RDP make much of a difference on microbial? Yeah, it, it, it really does. And, you know, of course, the old thumb rules real still still really apply. If you're feeding a lot of alfalfa, especially alfalfa silage, you, you probably shouldn't be feeding urea <clears throat> because you're basically feeding the same thing that's winding up from the from the haylage. If you're feeding more corn silage, you can feed more urea basically because you're you're providing more of the RDP from soy and other sources that aren't so don't have this instantly available kind of a pool. 
So you probably can feed some urea. In fact, um, plenty of diets show that. And then if you feed more than that, you're really not getting much benefit out of it. it uh, you're kind of overfeeding the ammonia fraction that microbes need. The, like the Cornell model is kind of separating, looking into ammonia versus peptides, and urea can only provide the ammonia fraction. So there, there clearly is a limitation. And what we're seeing is that it's the non-ammonia, the, the true amino acid part that's really stimulating efficiency of microbial protein synthesis. It's not that efficient in stimulating it, but it, it clearly does. And then, of course, some of the amino acids that are in RDP that aren't taken up directly by the bacteria, they get turned into ammonia. So it's kind of a progressive stage. And we're, we're very interested in trying to figure out what is the optimum between, you know, the amount that's providing ammonia versus the amount of amino acids that are directly taken up and stimulating efficiency of microbial growth. And they clearly need both. Introducing Ultrasorb R3.0, Volac's comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 is a species-specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharide binding capabilities. Endotoxins such as LPS can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production. Learn more about Ultrasorb R3.0 at volac.com. You, you spent a lot of your life working on the last nasum. And one, one thing you contributed a lot to was the, M, the microbial protein synthesis equation. How, how did that change from the, from the old model and what, what improvements are still needed in, as we go into the future with new, new software and new models? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, of course, you, you get done and then, you, and then you start testing it and you find out the, the issues. Um, the benefits uh, t to me clearly are the older system worked, but it wasn't really very mechanistic. It relied on total tract digestibility and relied on. So if, if there's protein digested in the total tract, it, it's part of TDN and that's included in what was affecting microbial protein in the rumen. So, so my biggest beef with it was it really wasn't very mechanistic that uh, standpoint in that, in that regard. So, so the, the newer equation now kind of makes it much more likely to be representing what you really are, are trying to do. The, the real issues that, are, that still remain is trying to predict rumen degraded fiber and rumen degraded starch, and then how do those affect the microbial protein? Of course, that's the main source of energy and carbon for the microbes. And there's still some real holes there um, some of that is with how, how studies were, were done. They all use the same forage within a study. And then, as you know, when we do the stats, that kind of gets embedded in the study effect. So, so we're still trying to figure that out. That really made, us, made it tricky for us to try to figure out how do you account for different processing of grains. So if you have coarse ground corn and then you grind it more finely, you get increased starch digestibility in the rumen. That should be making more microbial protein. We just didn't have a very good way to, to account for that. So there's still plenty of room left to try to fix that. Um, Helene Lapierre just had a paper with Roche Martineau. I don't know if you've seen it, Bill, but it, it's kind of showing the NASM model versus some other models. And what you see is increasing microbial protein with higher producing cows. It seems to not, not be doing as well. On the other hand, that's using data all with newer, newer studies using an omasal flow technique that kind of wants to overrepresent um, the microbial protein. So, so we really still are going back to the building blocks. I still think we need to do a better job of actually measuring microbial protein with higher producing cows. So much of the data we had are from older studies that, you know, where intake would, you know, maybe be 20 kilos a day instead of 30. And so, so that's still a big limitation in the data ability to predict this for higher producing cows. 
I guess what you're telling me is there's still still a lot to do, so you can't retire yet. So. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it makes me feel like I have a brown belt, not a black belt. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's good talking to you. Yeah, I'm glad to talk to anybody. If they want to talk to me, send me an email, and we'll talk microbial protein way more than seven minutes. <laughs>